Thank you, Simone. And it's a, a real pleasure to be here with you today. And I should say it was very fun to hear about the examples in Thailand. I was an exchange student in Thailand many years ago. So it's wonderful to see the, the traction taking place. Um, I'm going to talk about more biodiverse cities. And I add a question mark there because I think this is kind of an elusive concept in terms of what do we really mean by more, more biodiverse cities and, and how does that link to uh, the wonderful presentations we just heard about more inclusive cities, which might I add, talked a lot about biodiversity as well and certainly urban forestry. Um, so working for WWF, you can't not start with an image of a panda or a tiger or you know, some important iconic species. I will also use this as a disclaimer to say, I am not a biodiversity expert. I am a cities expert. Um, but I think the, the more this concept is becoming increasingly integrated. So whether we talk about inclusivity, whether we talk about biodiversity or climate action, uh, they really meet in the middle in the urban area. Uh, but before going into the city space particularly, and I'd like to kind of complement the previous speakers by kind of zooming out a little bit. Uh, so this is uh, the Living Planet Index, which is a big report that WWF produces every two years, the Living Planet Report, um, and it is some staggering data. We have seen since 1970 that the population sizes of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, reptiles have seen an alarming drop in average population size to 68%. That is almost 70% that we have lost uh, in a period that, you know, some for some of us is our lifetime or, or less than our lifetime. So this is a, a, a really uh, scary number and we need to reverse this trend. In some parts of the world, for example, Latin America, where I just moved back to Sweden from, uh, this is up to 90%. So this is a, a huge problem and something that we need to resolve. So what WWF has been pushing for, and I, I mentioned this because this is really a global push, we are calling for something called a new deal for nature and people, uh, because we can't just talk about nature anymore. We have to see nature and people together. Uh, a big part of this is something that we are calling uh, the leaders pledge for nature. And I'm very proud to say that last year at the UN Biodiversity Summit in September of 2020, um, we had, I think originally 80 heads of state, and now the number is up to 92 heads of state, uh, as well as the European Union, sign on to this idea of a leader's pledge for nature. And what this really is, is a united symbol to scale up global ambition and encourage others to, to jump on board. And we want to see that we reverse biodiversity loss by 2030 and start to move in a more positive direction. Now, I know this event is about cities and about urban forestry, but you know, cities aren't nations. And yet cities are also of course home to more than half of the global population and growing by the day. They're also home to uh, huge amounts of our, our economy and GDP. But I really wanna focus on two numbers here in, in context to this presentation. So cities are responsible for 75% of natural resource consumption. If we don't get natural resource consumption correct, we can't get biodiversity correct. Um, cities are also, you know, I'm going to Glasgow on Friday uh, for the UN Climate Summit, so I could not not talk about climate change in, in connection to this too. Cities are hugely important if we're going to get uh, a hold of the climate crisis. And so here I just want to point out very briefly um, how WWF has sort of entered the city space. Why is a nature conservation organization working on cities? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we know that if we wanna turn those staggering statistics around, we have to work in the urban space. So 10 years ago, we started something called the One Planet City Challenge. Um, and this year we had over 275 cities join us. Um, and actually, Simone, I, we've just redone the statistics. So we've actually had 700 cities join us on this journey now, not 600. So that was new to us as of yesterday. Um, so these numbers are kind of moving in the right direction. And, and what we're trying to do here, particularly, and I'm going to quote Frank on this, the role of data. We need to set a baseline to know where cities are in order to help them to uh, move on the right trajectory. This is primarily focused on climate data. Uh, but there's a lot of linkages between climate and nature data. And right now what we do is we work with the CDP and ECLE and we get cities to do their climate data reporting. And then we assess that data to see how closely they align to the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree target. 
We also work in partnerships. So whether it's the organizations you just saw on the screen there, or something called the Science-Based Targets Network, which has approved our assessment uh, uh, framework as one of the endorsed methods to see how closely cities are aligning to this uh, Paris Agreement at the local level. Interesting to note that the Science-Based Targets Network has also been talking a lot about how to better assess and measure uh, nature's uh, data in cities. So this is something that is high on the agenda and in discussion will probably uh, come to the surface at, at in the next year or so. So stay tuned on that as well. Um, now, I know this is about biodiversity, but I can't not talk about climate change because they are so inherently interlinked. Um, and this is a, a, a graph that we came out with a few years ago, just to show the importance of meeting this 1.5 degree target. Now, it's not just about an uncomfortable temperature range. It's about a huge difference in terms of species loss, extreme weather events, access to water, especially in urban areas. How many people will be impacted by this? I'm not going to go through this uh, slide. We don't really have the time, but I'm happy to share it with you later. But just to remind us, as we move towards Glasgow next week, every degree matters, and especially in our cities. Um, a city like Beijing has already warmed by more than 1.5, 1.7, and under a business as usual scenario, it is expected to rise by 6.1 or more. So we need to think about how cities are connected, and I know that the previous speakers also talked a little bit about urban heat island, but it, it needs bearing uh, and attention again. Um, and of course, urban nature and urban forestry are a huge part of this. They're not the only solution, but they're a key part of kind of keeping our cities cool. Think of our natural cooling solutions uh, as opposed to mechanical cooling solutions, which of course are growing quite rapidly uh, in Asia. And I also wanted to just take the, the moment to point out that um, the Cool Coalition, which has a fantastic name, um, and, and quite a lot of organizations behind it is coming out at, with a sustainable urban cooling handbook, which will be formally launched next week uh, at the UN Climate Summit. And I want to just kind of flag that there is a chapter uh, in there on nature-based solutions for cooling, and we will be hosting a webinar on the 2nd of December. So if you want to know more, I'm happy to share the details with that uh, to you. So just kind of, you know, all of these things are so connected. Um, I don't want to talk too much about inclusivity since we already had a great presentation on that, but I do want to share a little bit about WWF's We Love Cities campaign. And this is something that we connect to our One Planet City Challenge, which is really focused on uh, engaging local leaders. And I love what Frank said about, you know, public opinion sways political opinion. And this is what we try to do with We Love Cities. It is a public engagement campaign to get citizens to love where they live. If they don't love where they live, they don't want to envision how it could be better. They don't want to see, you know, pick up trash or plant trees, but we see this as a place, a kind of a level playing field that happens in particular cities that are part of our One Planet City Challenge, but they also create a collective network of ambition and learning. So you have local leaders uh, like a, a mayor in a, a Filipino city over on the, on the right, working with local citizens to plant trees. This can be done and it is being done. And this is what's really exciting. And we've had a lot of traction both in social media, but also in the physical space of our cities. So this is, um, I wanted to talk just in the, 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 under, or the lower, or the second half of my presentation, just to kind of share with you some examples that are not WWF, but kind of showing where the trends are going. I'm sure many of you have heard about this Milwaukee concept of forestry, where it's dense forests um, that grow quite fast in a very biodiverse rich area. I know there are some questions about this method, um, but it is, a, a, it is being practiced in a lot of cities and, and creates a lot of biodiversity um, and connection, especially for urban residents. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about planning um, because, you know, both with what Oraya showed us and the idea of pocket parks, but, you know, how do we design our cities today? This is so important if we're going to talk about biodiversity or we're going to talk about inclusivity. Um, in many cities, uh, 40 to 60% of public space, 40 to 60% is dedicated to cars in the forms of roads, parking, highways. So this is something that we need to really rethink if we're going to successfully accomplish a lot of what's been set forth in the Seoul Action Plan. And of course, we have all been facing uh, COVID, 
which has had many, many, many negative consequences. Um, and, and cities have been most affected by COVID with over 90% of reported cases, many very severe lockdowns and quarantines. I myself was not allowed out of my apartment for more than six months in Chile without two police passes per week and did almost get arrested for walking my dog. So it's very personal, but that's just the quarantine. It's not talking about the loss of life, the loss of jobs or all of the negative consequences that we have all faced. Um, but with every negative consequence and every challenge comes an opportunity to rethink and re-envision. And in the city of Santiago, where I was just living in Chile, we saw as, as the regulations started to ease, streets closing down to allow for local economic recovery and social distancing. But why stop there? You know, it was cities as, they, as the roads closed and cars got off, off the streets, we've seen around the world, air pollution improving, seeing the Andes, clearly for the first time in decades. And then, you know, we've started thinking at WWF and, and many others I know, but why do we create cities surrounded by cars? Why can we not create cities that are greener, more inclusive, more biodiverse? So these are some of the things that, you know, if we put planning at the center of this discussion, uh, we can really see a change. And certainly, as Frank said, mention and work with people. So this is what WWF would like to see. We would like to see the restoration of socio-ecological corridors in cities to both connect cities and ecosystems for urban resilience. And why is this important? Because cities have always been close to nature spots. When humans started settling down, we started settling down in the most biodiverse rich areas, places close to water sources, whether it's the sea for fish or rivers for transportation and food. So cities and, and biodiversity have always been interlinked and they will continue to be interlinked. Now these quotes, I wanna say, just give a shout out to our friends at the Nature Conservancy who put a wonderful report together that I do recommend called Nature in the Urban Century. Uh, and here are a few statistics here. And I mean, again, I will share this with you. This is straight from their report. Um, but you know, by 2030, 40% of strictly protected areas will be within 50 kilometers of urban spaces. So we need to get planning right. Urban growth can also destroy natural habitat and its uh, storage of carbon by 4.35 billion metric tons. Now, what does that huge number actually mean? Well, that's about the equivalency of um, carbon dioxide emissions from 931 million cars. So getting planning right, understanding it's, uh, the way cities are linked to biodiversity is, is hugely important. I just wanted to also say that this is a global trend. Um, and in fact, in many senses, WWF is joining on the bandwagon under the leadership of so many wonderful organizations, really talking about the concept of cities and nature, cities and biodiversity. Um, I could not not mention ECLE's wonderful work with IUCN, with TNC, and a growing list of partners, including WWF now, their Cities with Nature platform. And here, they're working with cities to do their data reporting on uh, on their nature targets, but while also creating a community of cities to learn from each other. Um, cities for Forest, we're going to hear from them in, in our session, so I won't uh, steal their thunder, but I just love this idea of both focusing on inner forests, kind of uh, surrounding forests, and as also forests further afield and linking the consumption, linking the SDGs, and, and so much more. C40, another big city network, just recently launched their urban nature declaration, which was signed by 32 um, leading cities. Uh, in order to protect communities for health and well-being, reducing climate risk and vulnerability, and certainly for creating more uh, green, biodiversity-rich cities. And the wonderful Naturevation Project, which was really about cities, nature, and innovation, it just concluded. It was a, a European Union-sponsored project uh, looking at creating, you know, so many different things when we talk about nature. So making space for nature, but look at all of these kind of key research findings. A lot of it is about inclusivities, equity, investment, collaboration. So when we talk about biodiversity, we're also talking about how it connects to everything else. Um, so I wanna just finish here, um, just plugging a new report that we put together and share with you a few examples. You can find it on panda.org slash urban nature, and it's called Urban Nature Based Solutions. Um, and we just, flag a few very successful cases, what we find, and there are so many more, but this is a short report. Um, we're also coming up with a new policy paper, so stay tuned for that. 
Um, and uh, that will be launched next week at uh, the Climate COP. So we will hopefully you know, provide some guidance for cities when they're talking about this. A lot of new uh, publications coming out, um, but just a few cities. Now, the city of Malmö, which I used to work at, uh, had a great project on preserving um, integrity and also restoring degraded ecosystems. Now, the, the cool thing about this project is it happened in one of the lowest income areas and it is now one of the pride of the city as an eco city Augustenbore. Um, so that went from having an area uh, surrounded by flooding and crime and abandonment to now being this test bed of successful ingenuity, bringing back biodiversity. What we saw is a 50% increase in biodiversity, 20% drop in carbon emissions, as well as a reduction on unemployment. The city of Medellin in Colombia, another fantastic example, really bringing this Green Quarters uh, project to life, how to de uh, restore degraded ecosystems and creating a greener Medellin for you to integrate people from the beginning of the project. So they really feel ownership. Um, 36 Green Quarters were uh, created. I think almost 9,000 trees were planted, a drop in average temperature, which is extremely important for climate, uh, but also for livability and 75 local people hired. The city of Singapore, the city state of Singapore, and they're also gonna be talking in our uh, presentation. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but just to say that, you know, what they have done in terms of uh, naturalizing um, drainage um, and, you know, working together has been so, so important. Learning that investing in nature can actually be cheaper than concrete gray infrastructure, especially in the long run. And this project has led to over a hundred species of birds coming back, three kilometers of a meandering river, and it's become a, a local tourist uh, spot. And finally, um, the, I'm sure many of you know this project, but the stream restoration project in Seoul, digging up a highway and bringing back biodiversity. And what this project has done and showed after uh, at least 10 years or more, a hundred species of birds are, can be found there. Three kilometers of another meandering river, also very popular uh, for visitors. So I'm gonna stop there um, and just to say, you know, thank you and um, just to share with you WWS motto, which is together possible. This is a complex topic, but we can uh, definitely get there if we work together.